Good morning. Welcome to Sportico's Champions Corner. Today's, um, I'm Asla Pelic. I'm the sports deal reporter for Sportico. My amazing guests here are, in alphabetical order, Raquel Brown. She is the head of media talent and esports of EA Sports, world's leading gaming and media company. A lawyer by trade before joining EA this summer, she spent 10 years at Fox Sports where she was most recently Vice President of Business and Legal uh, Affairs and helped oversee the company's biggest sports event productions from Super Bowl uh, to the 2018 World Cup in Russia and then 2019 World Cup in France, Women's World Cup. Um, I have Haley Rosen, the CEO and founder of Just Women Sports. Uh, she was frustrated by lack of media coverage uh, devoted to women's sports and started her own company to do this and better. Um, in 2020, such a short time, in two years, she raised m around $10 million already and um, in a, only a few years to grow this company from a media platform to major media company. Uh, she was named both Forbes' 30 under 30 and also um, she is an uh, athlete, soccer player, and midfielder. So we have uh, her on board, and I have Cameron Wagner, the Chief Client Officer of Brand Representation at Elevate Sports. She has 15 plus years. Uh, she has a 15 plus year of leadership at GMR, where she oversaw award-winning campaigns for major sports brands, including the Olympics and Fortune 500 brands like um, PNG, Home Depot, and more. Her brand representation team at Elevate recently supported the landmark pay equity driven partnership between NWSL and UKG. So welcome and thank you so much for being here. And as we planned, this to be a very candid conversation between um, us and I think we're gonna start from, I think my first question is to, for Raquel. Um, you just started at EA Sports, but not only you just started working there, they created this position for you, you made a big jump from Fox Sports to a gaming company, and can you tell us what was that like over a very short period of time and during the pandemic, so. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of feelings about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think trying to make career changes mid-pandemic, um, and I have my, my new team here who have all done the same thing where you, you interview over Zoom and so trying to get to know people and figure out is it the right move? A little bit harder over Zoom versus meeting somebody in person. Uh, but the move to EA was, it, it was actually a pretty easy one, a very um, a good fit and a good next step for me. I had spent 10 years in a business and legal affairs role at Fox working across these major events and helping build out these productions and was trying to figure out where, where can I go to take these skills that people transfer over, um, but do something a little different, a little bit more challenging, um, a new challenge. And at EA, you know, we grew up with these games. I mean, the EA sports games, you know, we're, we're just talking about when you, when you hear the word FIFA, a lot of kids now think video game because that's what we've created as a business over the last 30 years. And so to be able to transition into you know, an established company like that, but to build kind of a new muscle. So how do we partner with different media companies and kind of bring these you know, really authentic you know, simulation sports games closer to the real life sport? And so it's a lot of what I've done in the last year and a half and really built out a team to support that from the sports line. So bringing in sports experts, not games experts, I am not a video game expert by any means. And so I've spent a year and a half really learning the video game side of the business. But being able to bring those authentic sports backgrounds and experiences help us at EA to then be able to deliver on different objectives that we have across the business, whether it's media partnerships, working with different types of talent. Um, and it's a challenge. Um, I joke that our word of the year is patience because when you're building a new team and a new muscle and trying to you know, bring people on board with new ways of thinking, you can't just kind of barge in like a bull in a china chop and like try to get everybody to start changing the way they do things immediately. So you know, having patience with myself as I learn a whole new kind of area of the sports world, that's not, no fire alarms We're good. okay, um, no panic. So patience with myself as you kind of learn a new, part, a new business, building teams, patience with business partners, with external partners, um, I think that just sets you up for success. 
Before we go into the partnerships you're building now, yeah. let's go back to you because you just built a company from scratch, built a team, looking for new partners, raising money, doing all of this again in such a short period, period of time. Can you walk us through how from an Instagram or maybe like a little Instagram or writing about it became a media company and what were those steps for you for Just Women Sports? I can kind of give you my background. So as she mentioned, I was an athlete. I played soccer in college and then played professionally in the US and abroad and really got to see firsthand women's sports shifting. You know, we were selling out stadiums, attendance was up, viewership was up. There was just this really exciting energy that was happening in the space and you could feel it and you could touch it and you could see it. And I had a bunch of injuries, had to retire a lot sooner than I admittedly would have liked to. I moved to the Bay Area and I became a grown-up. I got a real person job and you know I thought my sports days were behind me but um, I think like many people that work in sports you, you love it you know your heart is in it it's part of you and so I still cared a lot. I had friends that were playing or coaches I was close to and I wanted to follow along and you guys have probably heard the statistic but it's you know three four percent of sports coverage is dedicated to women's sports and being on the outside I really felt that I all of a sudden understood what that meant. You could just not follow the space, which didn't make sense to me based on everything I had seen. On the other side, because I was really actively seeking out this content and wanting to be a part of that world, everything I was seeing was really young. It was you know, overly feminine. Um, it was a lot of lifestyle content. It just didn't feel like anything I had known after you know, being in that space for so long. And I just really found myself asking, you know where are the sports? Like, where are the highlights and the stats and who's at the top of the table and the bottom of the table? Like, where are the sports? And that is the whole idea for Just Women's Sports. We're exactly what our name says. We are Just Women's Sports. And, you know, really the vision we have for our company is to be that one-stop shop for all things women's sports. Going to say that a lot probably. <laughs> um, but we think there's an opportunity to basically, you know, build up the storytelling and you know the example that I always give is you guys probably all heard that Steph Curry broke the three-point record this season that was a regular season totally inconsequential game that everyone was talking about and watching that is storytelling and that's happening on the women's side but we're not pushing on it and so we're starting there that's our Instagram that's our Twitter that's you know all our social channels our website our newsletter we also want to work to make the product more accessible. You know, we think it's way too hard to watch women's sports. And we just signed a highlights partnership with the NWSL. We have a partnership with Athletes Unlimited. And we think it's just really, really important that people can actually watch women's sports. And so that's what we're pushing on. And, you know, we launched in 2020. This whole space is really nascent. We're really nascent as a company. But I think a lot of really exciting progress and a lot more to go. And you know, we keep talking about coming back to the same thing, partnerships. And Cameron, in that sense, like, you have seen, you had a seat at the table for such a long time. You are witnessing and seeing these changes of what partnerships work and what are the partnerships that work better to be able to bring women's sports into that main, you know, screen and so people can actually see it. Because women, as we know, are the main consumers. I mean, in a family or like we buy stuff, not only we buy for ourselves, so for brand partnerships, women um, audience must be important, although we know that women's sports are not only watched for, by women. But in your experience, what has been happening and what do you want it to change maybe so that all of this will lay out properly? Um. First of all, Haley, I love what you're doing. When we were, um, I mean, that's kind of our go-to place because of what you just said, and we really see that on the brand consulting side, just the lack of opportunity to, for fans to engage with women's sports about the performance of the athletes and what they're truly delivering and not just lifestyle. So thank you for what all, you all are doing. I think, um, I think we're at a really exciting time for women's sports, and what the transition that we've started to see, which is, so exciting is for so long I felt like if a brand was going to do women's sports it was kind of housed under something that was purpose driven you know like well we're gonna we're gonna tackle the pay equity message which I love that needs to be attacked or we're gonna you know help in another area that that where there's a crisis or something's wrong and we're gonna see how we can help be a part of fixing that and we still need a lot of those types of partnerships don't get me wrong 
But the really exciting thing that I'm starting to see happen in women's sports is letting it stand on its own. And so, you know, when you're talking to brands about sports partnerships, putting women's sports at the table on its own merits, not as, well, you can do this, but, you know, really here's a purpose-driven initiative around women's sports, but letting women's sports stand on its own merits. And we still need a long way to go uh, to, for, for that to grow as much as we want it to from a broadcast standpoint, from an accessibility of the sports standpoint, but we're seeing it start to play out differently, which is exciting. It's really the first time I'm seeing it play out like that in, over the last year or so. And in eSports, um, what kind of partnerships you guys are planning so that you can actually bring both female e-gamers and also the, the sports fans, like, you know, how many women play the FIFA game? Like, do you have any idea of how that is gonna grow in that in the yeah. esports you know area so in gaming generally we look at kind of our players across electronic arts as a whole and it, it's almost half female okay. which i think surprises most people when you hear that and so when we're talking to our development teams and our brand teams about our sports games in particular it's you know people want to see themselves in the games that they're playing and so when you have female players who are you know, getting on sticks and playing a video game, how do they see a reflection of themselves in the games that they're playing? And so we look across our different sports titles and we're constantly having the conversation about what else can we do, what more can we do? Um, you know, looking at some titles like UFC back when you, know, you started having these you know, female matchups, our UFC game almost eight, eight nine years ago had you know, Misha Tate and Ronda Rousey, you saw them fight, you could go play as them in a game. And so, and so we've started to do that as soon as we could and we had the ability to do so across different games. You know, Dr. Jen Walter, who's you know very well known, you know defensive coach, um, you know in the NFL, you could play her as a coach in one of our modes within Madden. And so to have that representation within our games is really important for us. And as we continue, whether it's in esports or media partnerships, we're constantly looking for how we can, you know, just reflect the players that are actually playing our games. So what I'm hearing is if we had more faces and role models on screen where little girls or like anyone, um, boys and girls look at it and say, oh, I know who she is, what she's doing, and I wanna do that or watch that person do what they're doing best. So in that sense, how do brands approach athletes, especially women athletes, and how those partnerships should work in your opinion as an athlete? And then maybe, uh, Cameron, you can say what actually should or is happening or should happen so that we can see more of those people so they can go and play games looking up to them? Um, I think it's an interesting question. I think, you know, it's when we first started, brands, I mean, frankly, didn't take this seriously. They really believed that women's sports wouldn't monetize, that people didn't care about that. That has dramatically changed in the last six months, which I think is really, really encouraging and also for me is just such validation that we can keep pushing this space forward. But it was really funny to me to hear brands say, we want to target women, so we're gonna go towards all these other brands when we're saying, you know who watches women's sports? Predominantly women today. And that doesn't mean it's just by women for women, but it does mean that early adopter group is mainly former and current athletes and they're women and they're stoked on women's sports and also they're spenders as we mentioned. So. Um, I've always just thought if you want to target women, women's sports is a phenomenal place to do that. And I think as the space grows and evolves, you know, we hope to have sort of a more diverse community, but that's definitely the early adopters. I also think, you know, kind of what you got at is we are so into, we say this all the time, but it's hype, not guilt. There is so much like guilt in women's sports, you know, and it's always very serious and very heavy. And these women are doing all these amazing things for kids and this and that, and it's true. And we want women to be you know, doing everything they wanna do off the court, off the field, but for women's sports to truly be mainstream, to bring in the fandom we want, to push this to the masses, we need to lead with the sport and the fun and the joy and like that's what we like about sports. So we gotta bring that to women's sports. And I think in partnerships, that's what we wanna see in partnerships. And I can give Two quick examples. Um, initially, we got a lot of interest around sort of women's initiatives with brands. A lot of those activations flopped. We thought they would, we thought they were worth testing, they flopped. We actually just have a partnership now with Athletes Unlimited and Gatorade, and it's around power rankings and highlights and plays of the week. 
that is doing really, really well. People like sports. And so sometimes I think we over-engineer this and it's just treat women's sports like sports. Hard stop, you know? Yeah, I, th I think that's great. And I, I agree with that. I, you know, brands have always been interested in female athletes. So there's mm -hmm. not an interest level or a belief that female athletes aren't a wonderful way to connect with their consumers. Brands just can't do all the work themselves, you mm -hmm. know? And so you can go out and you can find the most amazing athletes on the field, off the field. They have wonderful stories, great stories to tell to consumers, great partnerships with a brand. But if the brand is the only entity really talking and telling the story of that athlete, that's a really heavy lift for a brand. Um, and so, you know, we kind of go back to the need, you know, the need um, to have more coverage for women's sports, different kinds of coverage for women's sports, more accessibility to knowing um, what's going on on the field and the game and the rivalries and the storylines that come out of that. The brands are willing to tell the behind the scenes story, but they're not gonna be the only ones telling the story. That's not gonna be sustainable for them. So I, I think that's you know kind of how brands are thinking about it for sure still. Um, you know, there's a very successful TV show called um, Drive to Survive, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was just thinking, um, in your opinion, and it's such a great medium to bring the athletes that we were not even were interested maybe like three years ago, but now they are day to day, like they're incorporated into our daily lives. We follow the show, everybody's watching it, women and men, men together. Um, there's not one female driver yet in F1, which is like insane to me, but you know, it's going to change eventually. Do you think those kind of media, brand, and sports partnerships could be a way of breaking that, you know, um, access and then making it more um, available to everyone and also making it more fun, like you just mentioned, so that we're like having fun while we're participating in this sports? You know, what do you think that would be? And if that is the way to go, which sport should they start from? Like, it's just a conversational question that I wanted to drop here. Well, we, we have a brand that's doing a F1 partnership right now, and we call those the Netflix fans, okay. um, which is awesome. I will take the Netflix fans all day long. It bolsters the sport. It's awesome. <laughs> so there is, it's undeniable that if we can put sports in the context of entertainment, which it always has been to its own degree, but crossover entertainment, it's going to help raise up the athletes. It's going to help raise up the sport in general. Um, I, my only concern is that if we're going to do something around women's sports or take a league or something, that it's done in a way that doesn't tri uh, make the athletes uh, trivial or leans towards the typical stereotypes that we've seen many times in the past of how female athletes are represented. Or we focus on the female athletes that we think are going to provide the most aesthetic value to the yeah. entertainment. I mean, we really have to treat it like we would Man. Men's property. Otherwise, we do so much damage, right? Like we just reinforce the stereotype. So I, I think it would be an amazing opportunity. It would have to be done right, mm -hmm. of course. I, I think totally, totally agree. And I think what I would add, though, too, is we have seen historically like women's sports really perform in big moments, for example, the World Cup or the Olympics. And I think for me, that's similar to a Netflix docuseries, right? It's like, a lot of really high quality production, concentrated in a moment, but then we see the spike and we see it go down. Why do we see it go down? Because we don't have basic media coverage, right? It's so hard to see the stats or the scores or just know the storylines. Like we almost take that for granted on the men's side, the lift that the legacy media platforms are doing, and then we can build all this premium content on top of it. So I think it's incredibly, incredibly important that we build the infrastructure first. It does not, like, I don't want to see a spike in flat anymore. You know, we want to have spikes where we get new fans, but then how do we keep that going? And that is the, the grind of covering, you know, the regular season NWSL game and WNBA games and athlete unlimited games and, you know, college sports. Like, we have to keep building it. And not because we have to, because it's the right thing to do, but because fans want it. And that's, you know, they want that consistent coverage and attention. And then once we have that foundation, yeah, we should do a docu-series and we should do documentaries. And it shouldn't be about the plight of women. It should be about them being dope ballers, because they are. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think that's what you guys are doing so brilliantly though, because you hear the Netflixes and these subscription services, 
they have something people get excited about, you have the peak, and then it goes away, and there's no sustaining that. And so, and you look at generationally, your millennials, and then your, what is it now, Gen Alphas, and so <laughs> I'm getting, they're starting over, it's getting confusing. But you look at younger, like the younger women, the younger boys who are playing sports and watching sports, and where do they consume it? They're not necessarily consuming it in the traditional ways a lot of us grew up consuming sports anyway. And so I think what you guys are doing makes so much sense where you've started because that's where so many people are spending time. So for them to go and consume it there and to be able to access it and access it so easily, I think helps build that. So then you can just authentically continue to grow it. And then, you know, we look at, I think it from an EA standpoint, like how we look to be that connectivity between real life sport and these younger generations who are playing sports video games and how do you kind of bring them together. And so I think that's where you start seeing opportunities to help educate younger fans and make them have these interactive experiences with sports games that also learn about the sports and make sure they're able to consume the type of content they want to consume. Because if they want to play as a female sports team mm -hmm. in a game, I'm pretty sure they want that female sports content in terms of stats and news and highlights. So I think there's so much opportunity there to do it kind of in the right way, though. You, you talked about cycles, and I think that is one thing that, um, especially around Olympics or you know the Women's World Cup, when we see more women on television, and how like short uh, moments of I think spotlight they actually receive. And also, in terms of dollars, they earn from partnerships, which I want to ask you, Cameron, like, women do get significantly less uh, financial, you know, um, I would say benefits from being the face of a brand compared to male athletes. We just did this, you know, best hundred of well-paid athletes for Sportico. And it was sad to see only there were two women that made it to that list, and the rest of them are like, I never heard of their names, like some guys that they, there's 24, and then they're above Serena Williams. And I was thinking, how is that possible? Why isn't she top and making as much money as LeBron James just because she's as famous as he is? So where is that, you know, how is that conversation happening? And I know this could be an off the record conversation sometime, <laughs> and I don't want to like put you on the spot. Like, we're well, curious we're about that. We're just friends. <laughs> we're just friends, and we want to know, like, do brands say, I only have this much money for this female athlete, and then it dif differs for men? Is that like. I've never heard a brand say, I only have this much money for a female <laughs> athlete. Thank heaven. Thank um, I, I mean, absolutely, brands have budgets, right? Yeah. And, um, and so they, I mean, that is a consideration, you know, what the budget is. And they know if they're going to go in and they're going to do a deal with LeBron James, they better come with a couple million dollars, you know. But, um, you know, it, this is kind of a, this is a convention that we have to, to break, you know, but, you know, brands look at everything based on ROI, right? And so mm -hmm. if they look and they say, gosh, I want to do this, you know, agreement with this female athlete, like, what's her Instagram following? What's her Twitter following? What exposure is she getting on the broadcast? You know, how much is she out there? That comes into the consideration because, listen, brands, a lot of the brands, absolutely want to play a critical role in growing women's sport. However, they also have to make smart marketing decisions with a finite amount of marketing dollars. So if that female athlete or that female sport is not getting the exposure of their male counterparts, unfortunately, that goes into the factor of how much they probably are willing to bring to the table for that athlete. Um, we do try to make sure that if, if we're comparing, I hate the term apples to apples, but I'll say it, that it's equitable. And I think brands are doing a really diligent job now at making sure that's the case. If everything's equal on the metrics, you know, that it's equal. The other thing that we try to talk about a lot, though, and I think this is really important, like being on the agency side and always on the sports agency side, we have always struggled with the ROI on sports versus some other forms of advertising. Mm. So the challenges that we're facing on women's sports on the ROI that they're getting from media isn't that different than what we face sometimes on sports in general when we equate it to how, you know, the exposure on running a 30 second spot or doing something else. We have to be sure that we're not just talking about the ROI numbers based on impressions and exposure, and we're talking about the depth of connectivity to the fan and the role for the brand.